Well, good evening, and thank you so much for joining us for the first edition of the 2024 Living Legacy uh, Education Series. And tonight, we are blessed to have one of the most um, chronicled and uh, amazing uh, uh, civil rights workers from uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and from a variety of other uh, aspects of the civil rights movement. We have Bob Zellner, who, by the way, is responsible for that song that you just heard, Been Down Into the South. Thank you so much for taking the time and putting yourself in the room tonight. And uh, we are thrilled to have you and thrilled to have the opportunity to hear the story of Bob Zellner. Uh, Bob's story uh, is well chronicled, as I said. It uh, was a feature of uh, the film by F Spike Lee, uh, which is Son of the South, and even more uh, powerful, uh, it is shared in his memoir, uh, The Wrong Side of Murder Creek, a white Southerner in the freedom movement. And tonight we're going to get an opportunity to have a conversation and to talk about his long service to civil and human rights. So I just want to say good evening, Bob Zellner, and thank you so much for joining us. So, good evening, Bob. Good evening, Pamela. Good, good evening. evening. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us tonight. Uh, I'm thrilled to have this chance to talk to you. Um, I, I said to you before we went on that I almost got a chance to meet you twice over the course of years. Um, and one of those times was at the uh, uh, anniversary of the 1964 Freedom Summer Movement. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, uh, at that particular gathering, I, I and a colleague of mine, Paul Murray, uh, brought some kids down to uh, commemorate that amazing event. And uh, I had to leave early, but you found those young people and sang with them uh, at one of the dinners uh, at that event. And they absolutely loved singing with you and with uh, Chuck Neblett and several others, so. Some of the freedom singers, yes. I remember we were we were in a tent or some kind of right that we had. It, it was in Jackson, I believe. Or... Yes, it was, on the campus of Tougaloo College. Yes, I remember that. Long history, so. So let's get started. Um, I just wanted to ask you to, uh, you know, you have an amazing story. Uh, it's certainly an unusual story. Uh, born into a family with deep Southern roots, uh, deep in Southern culture, uh, I think dating back to the 1770s. And, um, and one of the aspects of that family, not an unusual thing at that time, was that uh, your family, a very loving and, and caring family, was also uh, part of the Ku Klux Klan. And uh, not a, a particularly usual path for someone who would become part of the civil rights movement. <laughs> But I just wanted to ask you to maybe give us a little background on your family and uh, and growing up in that culture. Well, it's almost as if I was born in the uh, in the civil rights movement because uh, my father and mother had gotten married just after my father had come back from uh, Europe just <laughs> before the Second World War. Mm -hmm. um, there was it was a lull in the uh, uh, attitude of the United States because the, Germany was hoping that uh, the United States might come in on the side of uh, Nazi Germany. Right. Uh, so they really liked uh, to uh, unite with whoever. Uh, shared uh, similar beliefs in the Uni United States, and they found that in the Ku Klux Klan. In fact, uh, the uh, Nazi regime in in uh, Germany had learned a lot of their um, racial uh, hierarchy uh, beliefs. Uh, they they had inherited that from the United States, and <laughs> they said uh, at first, though. Uh, when they were considering um, the kind of apartheid and uh, genocide that they launched in uh, 
in Germany. They they said uh, the uh, racial situation and the apartheid situation in the United States was much too radical for oh my goodness <laughs> to ever accept, and it became the the model for um, their racial laws, and eventually uh, leading to the genocide that the uh, United States has been involved in ever since we hit the shores of North America. Oh, really? Isn't that, isn't that truly amazing? Uh, what an amazing statement just about our own history here and um, uh, the connection to uh, such a, a heinous part of our history. Um, so your father was traveling in Europe. Um, I understand he was in Germany and Russia. Yes, uh, my mother and father had uh, graduated from Bob Jones College, which was then in Northwest Florida, which hmm. later became Bob Jones University. Oh, okay place where all of the uh, politicians in the South would, uh, they would go there to speak to get their uh, Southern racial uh, hatred uh, <laughs> potentials. But my father had um, come to a realization when he was in Germany and Poland right before the war that uh, <clears throat> what was happening in Germany was the ultimate uh, way that uh, the Klan movement in the United States would go. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, beginning to men uh, enter the Methodist ministry, teaching the uh, teachings of Jesus, and he could not reconcile the teachings of the Ku Klux Klan with the teachings of the New Testament. So he began to uh, begin to what Daddy was described to me as wrestle with the angel. Mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. Eventually, when we were still young children, my father left the Ku Klux Klan. And when he did, his mother and father disowned him, and his brothers never spoke to him again in his entire life. Oh, my word. What a what an amazing separation, and what an amazing spiritual blow. Um, uh, so he actually talked to you about that experience growing up. And um, what did you take from, from that reflection? Well, I remember being um, <clears throat> fascinated with his story uh, because he said uh, that he went to Europe with Bob Jones, mm -hmm. a form, uh, Christian fundamentalist center in the middle of Europe to uh, convert the Jews to be Christians so the uh, Nazis wouldn't uh, um, commit genocide against them. And mm -hmm. I remember asking my father if he uh, converted any Jews. And he said, no, but they converted me. <laughs> I was a Klansman and came back uh, breaking with the Klan and, uh, and supporting the Jewish underground in their struggle against the fascists. Wow. And then he continued his ministry here once he came back, and, and that caused you to move a lot, right? Well, he, he was a Methodist minister, and that means that... Uh, we have a bishop and uh, we have an annual conference and you get an assignment every year. Right. After about three or four years in a church, uh, in the Methodist church, we moved on. And that's the way I got my introduction to the civil rights movement by uh, going every four years into a new little southern town and uh, having to confront all the bullies that wanted to <sighs> test your uh, your metal. We, right. I, in a very violent uh, culture, and you had to learn how to fight and be willing to fight very early. So that's why I was so fascinated with the nonviolent uh, movement. When I learned about that, I said, oh, I know about the violent movement. Let me find <laughs> nonviolent movement. So you mentioned in your memoir uh, two places in particular, East Bruton and, uh, and Mobile, Alabama. Uh, as being places that really kind of were pivotal uh, places where your evolution was kind of ramped up. Um, could you talk a little bit about those two places? Well, the, uh, the place that I did most of my growing up was East Bruton, Alabama, which is across Murder Creek from Bruton, Alabama. Hmm. And when mm -hmm. I was uh, living there for about four years as my uh, father served the uh, Methodist Church in East Bruton, Alabama. Uh, I, then I learned what it meant to be a little boy uh, in East Bruton because everybody would look down and say, boy, you're on the wrong side of Murder Creek. 
meaning that you were on the poor side of the creek, you'd never amount to anything and would give up any ideas that you have. And uh, that's why I realized that very early on, uh, you need encouragement, not discouragement when you're in a situation like that. And um, I, I began to uh, look at the class uh, situation because at that time, Bruton, Alabama was one of the richest per capita small towns in the United wow. States because it had about four or five, six millionaires. Wow. And, uh, there was a big class division between Bruton and East Bruton. That's why they said, boy, you're on the wrong side of Murder Creek. Right. <laughs> and then uh, you had you spent time in Mobile uh, with relatives, I believe. The, um, what was Mobile like in those days? Well, I, <clears throat> when I started school, I learned uh, and my family learned that I had a learning disability. I had dyslexia. And that was before there was even any name for dyslexia. And uh, we lived in Loxley, Alabama, not too far from where we live now in Fairhope. Mm -hmm. and, um, there was only one place in this area that had anything to do with um, learning disabilities. And dyslexia was called word blindness at that time. Wow. And, um, so Barton Academy in Mobile, Alabama was the only place in the Deep South that you could get any treatment for um, learning disability like dyslexia. And that's when I started spending uh, summer school in Mobile at uh, the home of my aunt, uh, uh, Aunt Peg and uh, my uncle Doug Pope. So I, I spent the summer of I've forgotten what year it was, but uh, between my third and fourth grade, uh, learning to read at Barton Academy in Mobile. And wow. uh, so it gave me a little taste of Mobile before we moved to Mobile for my last two years of high school, uh, before graduating in 1957 from high school. And that evolution uh, in high school actually carried right over uh, to college for you, correct? Yes, and uh, one of the bridges from high school to college was that uh, while I was in high school at uh, Murphy High School in Mobile, mm -hmm. uh, the first black student was admitted to the University of Alabama, and there was a huge outcry among all the high school students and how terrible it was that uh, Authorine Lucy was going to destroy the University of Alabama. And I would ask my classmates, how can one student uh, destroy an entire institution like the University of Alabama? And they said, well, they won't keep the university open if uh, it's got to be integrated. They'll close the university. And I said, well, it wouldn't be the black people that would be closing the university, it'd be the white people. Isn't that correct? <laughs> That was that year's uh, conspiracy theory, I guess. <laughs> yes, and that's when I learned that uh, you were not, uh, as a young Southerner in 1957, you were not supposed to be vocal if you disagreed with the segregation situation. If you had any other belief, you're supposed to be very quiet because you might get hurt. They would hurt you if you believed the wrong thing. Uh, that's so true. Prior to his death last year, Hollis Watkins uh, was one of our speakers often on our pilgrimages. And uh, he talked about the fact that he, at age 16, uh, went to a meeting and got involved with the civil rights movement. And from that point on, then he, but he actually talked about the fact that he had to hide his uh, participation at those meetings and his uh, burgeoning uh, participation in the movement. Um, and here you are, a young white Southern student um, starting to become at challenging your, your classmates and your teachers. Uh, what do you think gave you the authority at that point in your life to take that on? Well, part of the, uh, the thing that gave me authority was that um, the young people all over the South after the lunch counter sit-in started in Greensboro, uh, February 1st, 1960, mm -hmm. it just swept all across the South. The young people were the ones that were going to the lunch counters and going to, on the freedom rides to try to say, 
you can't uh, operate a segregation system in the South unless we cooperate. And we're not going to cooperate anymore. We're not going to segregate ourselves. We're going to sit in the front of the bus. We're going to go to the what is called the white waiting room. We're going to drink out of the white drinking fountain and all those things. You can't um, manage segregation unless we cooperate with it. And we're going to stop cooperating with uh, segregation. And uh, we killed uh, legal public segregation in the South. They have a, other ways of doing it now, but they can't be openly uh, racial in their uh, discrimination. Right. The Freedom Rides came uh, into Alabama in 1961. And um, you were obviously, according to your memory, you were obviously noticing and uh, did that, that brought you into a closer relationship. How, how did the Freedom Rides impact you and, and uh, did you find a role within that group? Well, I did, I did find a role there because um, when, we've, when I first got uh, crosswise of the authorities in Montgomery was when I was doing research for a sociology paper mm -hmm. which assigned uh, to study the racial problem and write our uh, thesis uh, for our senior level uh, sociology course in race relations. So we were supposed to write a paper about it. And when we told our professor that we were going to go interview uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and Ms. Rosa Parks and Brother E.D. Nixon, the branch president of the NAACP, our professor just, he found it unbelievable. And he said, you can't do that. And we said, <laughs> he said, we'll be arrested. And we were young sociologists so our imagination was completely piqued by the idea that you could be arrested doing research <laughs> and he said you don't know the first thing about uh, race relations in montgomery alabama in 1959 and we said that's why we're taking your course professor but how can we study race relations if we're not allowed to speak for to half the people who make up the race relations we only can talk to white people <laughs> So you and a, a number of your, your student colleagues took on not only the professor and the authorities at Huntington College, but also local authorities as well. Yes, we, we, uh, we had studied the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, and it says that you have freedom of speech, assembly, thought, and so forth. So we knew that we had the constitutional right to... Uh, find out and study. And we also told our professor that people had come from all over the world to study exactly what happened right there in Montgomery, Alabama, in the Montgomery bus boycott. Right. And we said, we're sociologists here assigned to study it, and we can't go and talk to the people that, that um, scholars come from all over the world. And they said, no, you can't do that. But we went ahead and we did it anyway, and five of us were asked to resign from school because we had broken the segregation laws. Right. And that was the end of my ministerial uh, career at Huntington College, and it was pretty much the end of my uh, official relationship with the Christian Church. Okay, wow. But it put you in direct relationship with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks, uh, who became almost mentors to you um what was the the having access to martin luther king like well martin luther king was uh was very generous with his time with us uh, young college students and i learned later on that he was everywhere dr king went for any length of time he spent a lot of time with not only young people but even the little children he hmm. liked to talk to the little children tell stories and he knew that the, the young people, and especially the children, were going to be the future of, uh, of the struggle in the United States. Right. And we've gotten through the 1900s, and uh, where the color line was, as uh, W.E.G. Du Bois said, was the major problem of the 20th century. And now we're entering the 21st century, and they want to actually go back and have another civil war. But uh, we find out that most of the people in the United States value democracy and they value their freedom and we're not uh, prepared 
just ordinary uh, civil servants. We're not prepared to go to an authoritarian government. We're not giving up on a democracy yet. Uh, how did exactly did the opportunity for you to become a field secretary for SNCC come about? Well, one of the ways it came about was that I was, uh, I knew that uh, Ms. Parks and uh, Dr. King himself and uh, Brother E.D. Nixon and uh, Fred Gray, all the people that were at the head of the uh, civil rights movement in Montgomery had all gone to Highlander Folk School. Uh, right, right. And um, I learned, uh, in fact, I was able to talk to uh, Ms. Rosa Parks about this when she famously said at a, at a workshop at Highlander on uh, grassroots organizing, boycotting buses and lunch counters and things like that. Uh, Ms. Rosa Parks famously was quoted as saying, it would be wonderful to do that in Montgomery, Alabama, but the black community will never stick together long enough to carry anything like that out. And it was right before they started the Montgomery bus boycott. So never give up on the power of the people. Amen to that. Amen to that. <laughs> so what, uh, so you were actually the very first uh, field secretary, the very first white Southern uh, field secretary for SNCC. Uh, what was your, what do you feel that was your biggest challenge uh, in that role? Um, uh, working, you'd already begun working with the black community and you already had uh, connections there, but uh, what did you find yourself learning in your new role? Well, I had to learn just about everything about uh, I had to do a lot of study of American history that I had not been taught in school. Hmm. I, I was uh, I was interested uh, academically because I was majoring in sociology and psychology. And uh, in those uh, courses, we had to study uh, people like uh, Gunnar Myrdal and uh, the American Dilemma. And um, so I had always been interested in why uh, the United States had so many, as much problems with race that other people didn't seem to have. Uh, in Europe, they didn't have nearly the uh, race consciousness that they had in the United right. States. Mm -hmm. And then when I began to really delve into the um, beginnings of uh, the United States in North America, I learned that uh, it was uh, the whole settlement of North America was based on uh, something called the Doctrine of Discovery, which was uh, formulated by the Christian popes during the age Catholic. of discovery, Catholic. the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And that was that if you found uh, people on, on islands or other continents that don't know uh, about Jesus Christ, then you are free to take their property, uh, take over their land, uh, kill them if necessary, take their gold, uh, mistreat their women. So all of those things were based on uh, the doctrine of discovery, which was the same as uh, what slavery was based on itself. Uh, mm -hmm. People in Africa and they don't worship Jesus, so we can kidnap them and put them in a, uh, a life of uh, forced labor. So what were your basic duties? Um, I know you traveled uh, far and wide uh, uh, as a field secretary and um, uh, doing registration and um, now what was your what was your main focus? Well, you probably never would have heard of me if I hadn't been uh, the campus traveler. I was hired uh, with the student nonviolent by the student nonviolent coordinating committee mm -hmm. to be the campus traveler, and that meant that I traveled all over the deep south. Uh, to college campuses, primarily white college campuses, to uh, interpret uh, what I understood was going on in the civil rights movement, because there was huge interest of uh, all levels of young people in the country mm -hmm. about what's happening in the civil rights movement. So I was able to travel around. And uh, before you could do that as a SNCC field secretary, you had to uh, be sure that you could uh, write uh, a reasonable article. So mm -hmm. we had to learn journalism 
And we also had to all be trained as photographers. So I'm looking back at the old issues of the student voice, which was the the uh, newspaper of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And I see a lot of articles on uh, in different places on what's happening there, along with photographs. And I, I have a byline as the writer of the article and uh, of the photographer. So I learned very valuable um, um, skills as a, as a young uh, SNCC organizer. And then uh, what happened to me was since I went around to a lot of the different places where we had uh, projects, when the fundraising came time, uh, Jim Foreman would say, Bob, I need you to go to New York with me. We're having a fundraiser and they want to know what's going on in uh, um, Philadelphia, Mississippi or Macomb or Jackson or wherever. And... Um, so uh, I would go and uh, and do the uh, fundraising things in the north. So I got to be known as a as a communicator uh, on the SNCC staff. And then when um, uh, Dottie and I got married in 1963, she was uh, one of the chief uh, uh, workers with Julian Bond in the communications department of SNCC. So. She was in the communications department. I was in kind of the grassroots organizing department. And uh, that's the way we began our uh, organizing as a couple, Dottie and I. Mm -hmm. And uh, today I'm organizing couple with uh, Pamela. So we have the same kind of relationship uh, that we've had ever since we met in South Dakota. How many years ago, darling? Five, six years ago? 10 years ago. Yes. Seven years ago. <laughs> Who's counting, right? <laughs> time flies when you're having a wonderful time. Indeed it does. <laughs> so you were organizing and you were fundraising and uh, you were also getting yourself arrested. Um, in, in reading, I saw that you, uh, you demonstrate very clearly that you were um, very much connected to the belief uh, that it was important to put your body on the line. And, um, and that was a very big value. Um, would you talk a little bit about that as um, not only then, but also now? Well, uh, quite naturally, if, when I came to uh, volunteer uh, at the SNCC office in the summer of uh, and fall of 1961, no, in 1960, uh, they were um, naturally a little bit suspicious of this uh, redneck uh, from South Alabama with this terrible uh, Peckerwood accent coming to a black run organization and saying they wanted to be a part of it. So a lot of suspicion. But once you went to a place like Macomb and uh, the high school students march out of school to protest the murder of Herbert Lee and you go along, you're the only white person in the whole demonstration. So they are going to you're going to take a, a, a beating. I didn't know they would. Uh, after they beat me, they would take me to a tree and put a rope around my neck and say, we're going to hang you. I thought they were overreacting. It was my first demonstration. <laughs> Turns out they were pretty much on point. <laughs> uh, we've got a question uh, that coming from one of our... Uh, but, but uh, I guess one of the points of, that I wanted to make in that last story was that the way you... Uh, the way you gained the trust of uh, the sisters and brothers in SNCC was to be in the foxhole with them. Right, right. To be solidarity, uh, judging from the same bullets that they were, and uh, to have. Uh, and the only way you could have the courage to go to Macomb, Mississippi, and march in a uh, demonstration in that clan-infested place was to uh, turn your life over to God and say, whatever happens to me is in God's hands, not my hands. So I didn't have to worry about it. I wasn't even afraid when I thought they were about to hang me. Wow. That's uh, that's powerful courage there and powerful faith. Uh, some years ago when we were talking to Hollis again, um, he asked our group uh, what we thought the uh, 
SNCC workers were most grateful for. And we guessed all kinds of things about, you know, solidarity, community, music. And um, he said, no, not at all. He told us that uh, he was grateful most for dirt roads, which he said, you know, if it was dry, you could drive on that dirt road. It would kick up the dust and uh, keep a distance between you and the clan cars that were chasing you. Uh, did you have, I imagine you did, have any close calls that uh, uh, required that kind of uh, escape? Yes, I, had, I did have some of those. I remember uh, when I first started working with the uh, with the woodcutters after after the snick years, we started a grow project, grassroots mm -hmm. work, which we also call "Get Rid of Wallace." <laughs> so I I knew that we were going to have some some hairy uh, um, automobile work to do, so I got a. Uh, uh, early model of a Volvo. It was a, a reliable car, and I had uh, driven uh, Volvos before with a stick shift and uh, uh, brake and clutch and so forth. Mm -hmm. And it was a wonderfully maneuverable car, and it was very fast. So mm -hmm. I didn't have uh, a lot of trouble with uh, when I was driving the Volvo, but sometimes I drove the uh, VW bus, which was uh, one of our main vehicles, uh, and um, that was not very fast and not very maneuverable. So I had a lot of uh, run-ins with the clan on uh, highways when they try to run you into a bridge abutment or run you off the road in some way. And uh, but uh, I was I was very lucky, and uh, even though sometimes I had all the windows shot out of my car. I never got hit by a bullet. Wow. It was close, but it always missed me. So I always thought that uh, the uh, reasonable thing you think of is, okay, I didn't die that time. God must have some more work for me to do. And I hope it has another 20 years that I can be able to tell the story and work with people like you who are recording and preserving the story and passing it on and inspiring new generations of young people. Well, we certainly hope that you have another 20 years as well. Uh, we've got a question from uh, one of our viewers tonight. Uh, Ned Wright asks, what was the range of receptivity versus resistance and antagonism toward uh, racial justice on white college campuses? Well, one of the uh, things that was so difficult on uh, white college campuses was that uh, at that time, we were very close to the, uh, the the apex or the epicenter of the civil rights movement. And it was just like uh, before the Civil War, the first Civil War in, uh, in this country, it was okay to be um, anti-slavery. And people would just say, oh, so-and-so is a little bit eccentric. He believes in uh, um, abolition. So they would be... Uh, for many years in the South, you could be an, an abolitionist and you were tolerated as an eccentric individual. But the closer it got to the um, beginning of the modern civil rights organ, uh, movement, the less uh, leeway there was to be a dissident. So if you disagreed mm -hmm. in any sense whatsoever, you got their attention. And the first thing they wanted to do was to divert you from any uh, involvement on the side of uh, uh, people of color, uh, labor uh, labor organizing, or women's liberation, or uh, immigrant rights, any of those things uh, that marked you as a as a potential subversive. And mm -hmm. we had, uh, we had a program in the United States government called COINTEL Pro. And it was run by the head of the FBI to destroy the civil rights movement. So right. we not only had the Ku Klux Klan to fight, sometimes we had to fight our own government. Three times I was charged with overthrow, attempting to overthrow the government of the United States. And now people actually do that, and it's very difficult to get them charged, much less convicted of sedition. I was charged three times with trying to overthrow the government. Wow. Now, in 1964, we know that um, the uh, 
SNCC and, and several other organizations decided to have Mississippi Freedom Summer. And we recently had Dave Dennis come in and uh, do one of these programs and speak to us and uh, talked about the various dialogues that came about um, in kind of deciding which direction, you know, what emphasis to put on. And in the case of the Mississippi Freedom Summer, um, Dave Dennis said that um, he initially was opposed to um, holding that event, um, which I understand there was a lot of discussion and dialogue. Uh, where were your thoughts on that uh, in the run up to that movement? Well, my thoughts were, were that um, it, it was definitely going to be a, a wrenching experience to bring students from all over the United States, especially highly privileged students, highly educated, wealthy students to come to the South because we had worked um, for years and years to uh, give the young people in the South um, skills like writing uh, articles and photography and mm -hmm. uh, uh, using a mimeograph machine, running a meeting, all of those things. And uh, there was a lot of concern that uh, these hotshot students from Yale and Harvard and the Ivy League and all of the California um, university systems that they would be coming to the South and they would push the young people that were in the South aside and said, I can do that better than you. I can type, uh, type uh, you know, 233 words a minute. And uh, I know how to run that uh, mimeograph machine. Right. And there was some of that in uh, the summer of 64, uh, some, some of the people who came south were not sensitive enough to uh, consent to be led by uh, local young black people. Right. So we all, it was a learning experience for all of us. And um, it was a, it was a tremendous success. A lot of people say, oh, it was, it was sad and terrible. Many people did lose their lives, but uh, it was a worthwhile uh, event. And one of the main uh, things that came out of it was the Head Start program and uh, the Freedom Schools. Mm -hmm. A direct demonstration of the uh, poverty of the public school system and uh, the kind of uh, history teaching that we had always uh, endured in this country and not knowing about the history of uh, genocide against the indigenous people and mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the bad attitude of all of the conquistadors that came, uh, the Europeans that came to take over this land as if it was theirs, just God given. So uh, it's, um, it's a culture that we grow up in and we have to, um, be a dissident and we have to take a big risk in making this country what it's supposed to be and what it says it is. I actually uh, had the privilege of working um, at a Head Start Center um, just after, uh, well, actually in the 19, uh, late 1970s and 80s. And um, that program uh, in inner city Philadelphia was uh, just a, a major connection to getting kids into uh, a good academic frame before they went into uh, their, their regular schools. So uh, that was really quite a payoff from the civil rights movement. Um, and um, you mentioned, you mentioned, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I said, I'm glad to hear that because uh, we, we need uh, feedback. That was one of the main things we had in 1963 on the March on Washington. We expected 100,000 people in uh, over twice that many came right. and the affirmation that what we were doing was the right thing in the uh, lunch counter sit-ins freedom rides and uh, the uh, the freedom schools in uh, mississippi and head start and all the good things that came out of that movement you mentioned uh, earlier the uh, organization grow um that's not an organization i think that most people are aware of uh, in the litany of uh, civil rights organizations would you Talk a little bit about that organization and its uh, its goals and missions. Yes, GROW stands for Grassroots Organizing Work. And that was the project that uh, Dottie and, and myself uh, 
proposed uh, to SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, because mm -hmm. they kept telling us, and they were right to tell us that. Uh, they said, we, we've got the uh, Black community taken care of. We, we don't need any more help here. Thank you very much. But you need to go organize white people. <laughs> Can you imagine the people that's been shooting at us all that time? And now we're supposed to go organize them. What do we do? We just <laughs> walk in and say, hey, we're from SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We want to organize with you guys. <laughs> you had to think of a whole new way of organizing. And the only way that you were going to reach more poor and working class white Southerners, you weren't going to appeal to them on the basis of Christianity or kindness. or You had to do it on a material basis. For your material well-being, you need a strong union, you need a good school, you need jobs for people, you need hospitals, you need all of those things. Did the Ku Klux Klan get any of that for you? They promised all the time that they're going to take care of the poor white working people of the South. Right. They've sold you out every time. They're the main anti-labor union force in the United States. And we began to challenge the Ku Klux Klan directly on their territory. They did not know how to deal with us because we <laughs> were from SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We worked with SCEF, the Southern Conference Educational Fund. We're called communists. I've been arrested 20, 18 times, whatever it was. And uh, I'm followed by the FBI all the time. And these old cluxers in these uh, backwoods, they say, you think you're the only one being harassed by the FBI? <laughs> and uh, so we, we made a kind of a connection there. Right, right. That definitely the government did not, J. Edgar Hoover did not want to see black people and white people at the poor level in the South get together because they knew that we had the power. It's like, uh, I think it was Shelley, the poet said, uh, rise up like lions who have slept during the night and shake off the dew. You are many, they are few. So this was the struggle that we're going to get all the poor people together. And there's no power that can stop us uh, from getting the things that we need if we stop being racist to each other. So you have really pointed out, obviously, a, a, a big issue that is uh, part of our present uh, situation here in the United States, um, certainly uh, one of class, but also continuing to be one of race. Um, and looking at that um, idea, um, Reverend William C. Barber also with the um, uh, Moral Mondays and the work that he's been doing um, with the Poor People's March and all of that. Um, as you look at where we are in this time and as you look at the work that you've already done, uh, what thoughts do you have about ways forward? You know, people kind of throw up their hands and kind of say, well, you know, what can we do? Well, I think one of the ways forward is to um, maybe not be so political. And uh, in, in a way, uh, I've always been very political in my whole life, but uh, now I'm studying uh, a, a new uh, religious approach called Baha'i, the Baha'i religion. Mm -hmm. And Baha'i religion says we all need to be registered to vote and we all need to vote and be uh, acquainted with the uh, issues, but we ne need not to be political. So uh, the best kind of organizing is not to be political, is to um, identify with all the people who have that same problem and try to get them together on the basis that we always have 80% uh, agreement and uh, our disagreement may be 20 or 30%. So let's work on the things we agree on, and then we'll uh, disagree agreeably on those other things and try to work it out uh, so that we can make a solution instead of just continue to fight each other and um, sink further down in the hole. If, if you're in the hole, stop digging. Get out and <laughs> help each other. Uh, be on an equal basis. I love that. <laughs> if you're in the hole, stop digging. It's just getting deeper. <laughs> uh, I've got a question from uh, our two of our uh, co-founders at Living Legacy, 
uh, Judy and Gordon Gibson, and they write, In your book, you describe using your strength and training in boxing, wrestling, fencing, and other physical activities, as well as youthful experience with successful street fighting as keeping yourself able to walk away and keep working. If you hadn't had those skills, do you think you would have survived? Um, I never expected to survive. And uh, I, I was always surprised uh, when I was in a was in a really bad situation, and I mm -hmm. thought I was not going to live much longer. And uh, but I was always um, I think my training in martial arts uh, helped me, especially when I was thrown into strange jails with a large uh, white uh, southern population, and the police said, "Here's a freedom rider." Mm. Didn't know what to do with him, so uh, they deliberately uh, incited the uh, prisoners to um, to do violence to you. Wow. And I think that my training in um, martial arts helped me a little bit because I would always be sure that I had a corner, that I was I had a strong something to my back, and mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I was confident that I could deal with anything in front of me. And I was attacked sometimes with knives, and um, it it helps to be a good fencer if somebody comes at you with a knife, <laughs> because you know exactly what to do. Uh, and if you have a blade yourself, you can uh, punish them uh, unexpectedly. <laughs> you have faced some amazing situations in your life. Um... A real testament to courage and uh, a, a willingness to just trust the universe to really make uh, a way for you. Um, and I want to ask you, because as a musician, I'm um, just kind of uh, fascinated with the fact that you are also, you grew up being a musician and um, certainly came in contact with the songs of the Civil Rights Movement, which were, as we know, were the glue of the movement um how your discovery of those songs and and use of them uh you want to talk a little bit about that well uh, there was one time uh in the uh, in the sniff experience uh, in the late 60s i think it was um we were the uh, freedom singers were doing a lot of uh, freedom songs and um there came a time when we needed to copyright some of the songs that uh, SNCC had uh, primarily developed. And so we had to have a large uh, SNCC meeting and say, okay, when did we first sing uh, Been Down to the South? What's right. this, that? And uh, people would say, oh, uh, that's the first time, first time I heard that was from Zellner. And I would say, yes, I, I learned that when I was in Sunday school about uh, been down into the sea mm -hmm. uh, and I've just changed the words to been down into the south and um, they'd say okay well you uh, groups uh, or uh, partnerships can't copyright songs it has to be an individual mm, so okay I got the copyright to been down to the south I think they gave me the copyright to woke up this morning with my mind on freedom because that was a favorite song of mine. Right. So whatever uh, whatever the group decided, that was going to be the person who got the copyright. But all the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, all, all the payment that you had to- Oh, the royalties. Pay, the royalties would all go to uh, community organizing. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I was very proud to maybe uh, copyright two or three of the uh, freedom songs, and I didn't write any of them. They were all <laughs> things that were uh, in, uh, in the church or uh, come from country music or uh, labor union music. We had the little red book uh, about the, um, oh, and we learned all the songs of the uh, Irish uh Freedom Fight, and oh, we had uh, Tom Hayden was a, a great expert on uh, Irish freedom songs. He knew all the Irish freedom songs. So we we had a big mixture of every kind of thing from blues and jazz, um, 
Irish uh, freedom songs, um, freedom songs from uh, the um, uh, Jewish underground in uh, in Nazi Germany, Pete Bog soldiers and all that. And we had Pete Seeger and other people who, and Bob Dylan, who originally was Bobby Zimmerman. Right, right. Always felt close because he's busy and I'm busy. And I'm hope to get him as the, I, I, I'm getting him to, I'm asking him to write a foreword to the next volume of memoir called Freedom Road. And hopefully we're going to have a, a documentary movie called uh, Freedom Road. It's about three quarters done now and a possible uh, TV series sometimes in the future. Oh, wow. That's exciting. I don't want to uh, leave you without asking about your time in the classroom. Uh, you went back to school after all of that, earned a PhD, and uh, uh, taught at uh, Long Island University. Uh, tell me about your time in the classroom and and um, what you know that connection with students brought to your way. Well, actually, I'm, it gives me a chance to correct the record a little bit. I did PhD study uh, in history at Tulane University. Oh, ah, okay. And I did the master's and a uh, thesis, and I did the uh, dissertation, but I never had a chance to defend the dissertation, so I never got my PhD. But I did get three doctorates, uh, honorary doctorates, from uh, Long Island University, uh, Fairfax University, and. Indianapolis, uh, Univer Indianapolis University, I think. So uh, I'm a doctor three times, but a PhD zero. <laughs> oh, well, I wanted to say Sankofa, uh, if you're familiar with that word, is a word from Ghana that means look back um, to see what we've missed, um, loosely translated. Um, and as you sit in this time, you're working on a new memoir. How did you like the movie, by the way? Oh, I really enjoyed the movie. And I was amazed at the uh, skill of uh, screenwriters and movie makers because Barry Alexander Brown, who was the director of the movie, mm -hmm. so uh, did most of the editing. It's very good to have a director, a movie director who is a skilled editor because they know exactly what they need to get in the can to make a good uh, movie. Right. Um, Barry Alexander Brown and uh, Spike Lee, both from Alabama, they did an amazing job. And um, Barry wrote the first draft of the script just from stories that I told him. The book, book wasn't even published in until 2008 and we started wow. working on the movie in uh the 1980s so um and he he did this movie from the stories that i had told and then he mixed in stories of his own experience mm -hmm. in the uh, script so he did a um, a wonderful script that is very southern it's funny if you uh, can catch all the lines but uh some of the lines if you don't know the story, you don't quite catch the line. It's it's not so funny, but <laughs> you know, Cult cultural you know, crossing. Southern people that was uh, that had the humor and the uh, uh, all of the adventure of the civil rights movement, and uh, it's a new vision of uh, filmmaking. We used to have the cowboy movies, and now we have the civil rights movies, right. and. All, um, morality tales they are heroes and and uh, villains and it's a hero's journey that you go through in your life and there's all the little stories that are in the arc of your life and uh, so all of the uh, students who are listening to this be sure to keep notes and anytime somebody wants to ask you questions about your own experience if they're writing a book or a paper or whatever give them an interview and that way you wind up in all the books and if people say that must be an important person i see his name or <laughs> it's mainly because you take the time to do the interviews and a lot of people say well they never write about me in the book and i said did they ask you for an interview and they say yes did you say yes 
He said, no, I didn't give him an interview. Well, if you don't do an interview, you're not going to be in the book. Right. <laughs> you got to learn to show up and show out. Well, I mentioned San Cobra and looking back, um, as you look back across this very wide, exciting, challenging, but uh, fruitful life of yours, uh, what are you most proud of? Uh, I am most proud of my mother and father and my four brothers because wow. he, uh, my father was the one that set me on this journey and he was faithful throughout uh, the journey. When I was arrested in Macomb and I had to go back uh, every two or three uh, months for a trial, uh, my father just was there every time sitting in the courtroom and uh, he he knew that uh, he knew the forces that we were up against because he'd been a member of the Ku Klux Klan for so long. Right. And, um, so that's what I'm proudest of. And the fact that my mother and father were able to make a reconciliation in our family because his side of the family was Ku Klux Klan and her side of the family were uh, Native Americans with uh, roots in the uh, Creek and the Seminole um indigenous communities in south alabama and northwest florida wow they are the ones that um and my brothers also they having a name like zellner in a small town and uh the newspaper has a, uh, an article on the front page about you being arrested in uh, baton rouge and charged with criminal anarchy and uh all of my brothers uh Douglas, David, and Malcolm, my younger brothers especially, and everybody would say, are you kin to that guy that just got arrested for overthrowing the government in uh, Louisiana? And they would say, yes, he's my brother, and I'm, we're proud of him. Wow. So they, were, they stood up when it was time to stand up. Well, that's an amazing testament to the spirit of family and the spirit of community you have lived a most fascinating and exemplary life. And we thank you for your courage and also for your openness and willingness. Um, I, I love the fact that all of, so much of this was driven by your curiosity and by uh, your willingness to uh, think out of the box and uh, live out of the box. Oh, uh, yes, oh, yes. Um, I remember how it puzzled my uh classmates were at Murphy High School and most of them were football players because I was in the band and mm -hmm. uh, we'd always travel with the football players and uh, many of them felt protective of me because I had had talks with them and I never hid uh, my ideas about race um, from anybody right uh, and they were they were very concerned about my safety, and they said you can't go around talking about that because people are going to hurt you. And then I would say, well, why are you so afraid? And these great big football players, I'm not afraid of anything. <laughs> I said, well, you told me not to uh, shoot off my mouth about integration because I'm going to get hurt. I said I'm not going to live in fear of getting hurt from somebody because of some I believe. Uh, in America, we're not supposed to get hurt because of something we believe. We're supposed wow. to have the right to believe that and to organize around it. And that's what uh, Paul and I are still trying to do. And we thank you for giving us an opportunity to tell the story. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. And we have uh, another opportunity for people to actually ask you direct questions. Uh, if you've been watching tonight and you uh, have a question that you want to ask uh, Bob Zellner, um, just look in the chat and you will find a link to a question and answer Zoom room. Uh, we have uh, Bob Zellner for another 30 minutes and uh, you can have a chance to ask your question. Um, thank you again for just a really marvelous conversation. And uh, I just want to say um, this uh, will be recorded and available um, after about a week or so on our website. Uh, livinglegacypilgrimage.org and also um, you can get information about upcoming pilgrimages 
And uh, certainly we also welcome any donations that you are willing to give to continue the work that we are doing in the world, uh, particularly around the issues of voting rights, which of course this year is uh, a very high priority for all of us as we continue to try to shape the world in ways that make it more fair and more just. Thank you all for watching. Uh, continue to work hard for freedom and justice. Keep the dream alive. Thank you.